I'm here today with Dr. David Deneev. He is an internist. He's specializing in lifestyle medicine. His focus is on prevention and treatment of chronic diseases through nutrition, fitness, and stress management. He's a clinician, he's an author, he's a researcher, and he's a motivational speaker. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. Well, thank you for having me, Jean. Well, my gosh, uh, this when I heard this story about you, I, it blew me away. You were diagnosed with cerebral palsy as an infant. Share this journey with us, please. Uh, sure, sure. I was diagnosed when I was one or two. I can't remember because I don't remember at one or two, but I wish I could. When my parents took me to different doctors, different orthopedists, they wanted to do surgery because with cerebral palsy, there's spasticity. And 80% of cerebral palsy patients have spasticity. And that's the type I had, spastic mm -hmm. cerebral palsy. And they wanted to cut my cauda quanai or horse's tail of my spinal cord to reduce this spasticity. And they also wanted to cut my Achilles tendon on my right side. Now, this would have reduced my spasticity, but it also would have left me in a wheelchair. Oh, and right. And fortunately, my father was a physician, so he didn't want to hear this. So they shopped around and they looked at all different physicians and they found this great physician at the Hospital for Special Surgery named Leon Root, who was recently the president of the Cerebral Palsy Association. He was a pediatric orthopedist and he believed that I could work this out through lifestyle modifications. Now, lifestyle really? modifications, yes. Now, what year was this? This was about 1971. Wow. Right, this guy right. is like light years ahead of most people. Right. It was light years ahead of most people. However, it didn't involve nutrition. It involved more focused on exercise. Okay. But that's what orthopedists do. But this was light years ahead of everybody else. And he told me I would be able to work out, work out and, uh, through a lot of fitness and through a lot of physical therapy, I'd be able to be better and get to where I wanted to go and be like everybody else, or at least try to be like everybody else. And what would happen with me in the meantime was every time I took three steps, I would fall on my face. And so I learned to pick myself up okay. and it was a big motivator because every time I walked, I would fall or every time I run, I'd fall every three steps oh. or so. And I wore, I wore a brace all the way up to my hip. And that was um, really motivating to do what I needed to do. And that was focus on the physical rehab. So luckily through years of physical rehab, I don't need the brace and my foot used to be turned in on my right side about 90 degrees and my uh, left, uh, my right arm um, was about uh, 90 degrees bent and my hand, my right hand, I couldn't really use the dexterity. So my parents didn't tell me why my brothers could take piano lessons and I couldn't. And so I always wondered why I wasn't able to take piano lessons. And the reason was I didn't have the dexterity in my right hand. So this to me was a motivator and I didn't, I wanted to be like everybody else. And then when I got to the point where I was like everybody else, I knew I could keep going. And so it was a great motivator to do this. And I give a lot of credit to my parents and I give a lot of credit to Leon Root, uh, Dr. Root at the hospital for special surgery. So if it weren't for them, I don't think I would have been able to do this. So this is sort of organic for me. And this is my way of paying it forward. Mm -hmm. Well, do you still have any symptoms today of, of the cerebral palsy? Well, I have, I'll always have some symptoms and it's always a reminder. I still have a limp. And mm -hmm. so when I get tired, I limp more than when I'm not. But now people ask me, oh, did you hurt your leg? They don't have any idea that I have journey. cerebral palsy. Yeah. And when I'm in the gym, people ask me, what supplements are you taking? Because you're really well defined. And I have to laugh because I think to myself, I'm just a scrawny guy who was suffering from cerebral palsy. And now people are telling me that, are asking me what supplements I'm taking. And I even had this guy in the gym the other day, and this has happened to me several times, this really big guy 
who takes his headphones off, turns to me and says, you work harder than anybody I've ever seen in the gym. And it was just an amazing feeling because you, you see that people admire Notice. what I do. Yes. Yes. They and they have no idea. Wow. Unless I tell them. Wow. And this was before, when I was diagnosed, this was before the American Disability Act. And so that was passed in 1982 during the Reagan administration. So we had to kind of hide the fact that I had a disability. Okay. Wow. Well, has this childhood experience, I mean, impacted your life in, in I mean, obviously, but in other ways, what, did, what have you taken away from this? Well, I've taken away that when you fall, you just get back up and you keep thinking positive, productive thoughts. And any frustration you have, you channel it into something that creates some great things. And I hate to use the analogy of you take lemons and make it into lemonade, but that's really what it's about. And it's not just making it into lemonade. It's making it much more than that. Mm -hmm. So I learned that no matter who you are or what you're disabilities are you can always bounce back and you can always do much better wow well did this have like did this choose you choose your course to become a doctor my course to become a doctor came from my influence from my father from uh, dr leon root i mean this whole thing this experience really influenced me to become a doctor so to answer that question in a really long-winded way yes okay all right. Well, did let me ask you a question. You, you started the Medical Compass MD in Brooklyn, and you believe wellness is derived through nutritional medicine, lifestyle interventions it, that pre, you know that prevent and treat chronic diseases. Could you expand on that? When I went to medical school and I went to residency and everything else, we were able to treat acute diseases or short-term diseases really well. You could go to the emergency room, you could go to your primary, you could go to a specialist, but we really didn't have a ton of exposure to chronic diseases and what you do with them. What our exposure was is that you put them on medicines and then nobody really knew what happened to them after that. I remember working in the emergency room as a resident and I said to the emergency room doctor, so do you know what happens to the patients after you stabilize them? He said, no, and I've never been curious about that. And that had a resounding what? effect on me. Yeah, it had a resounding effect on me. A really brilliant emergency room doctor, but it had a resounding effect. Like then what happens with their care? And this isn't to take away from these yeah. very positive emergency medicine doctors who are very powerful and they do great things to save lives and stabilize people. But it was a way that showed me that chronic care needed assistance, that people needed more than just the yeah. conventional approach. So I started looking outside and that's when I ran into what is either lifestyle medicine or integrative medicine. I call it integrative medicine because mm -hmm. it's an integration of both conventional medicine and lifestyle modifications, including the uh, nutrient dense diet, as well as stress management and fitness. And what I find is that unlike conventional medicine, there's reversal of disease. You can't reverse disease with conventional medicine for most chronic diseases, True. barring like hepatitis C with Harvani that um, Gilead Sciences has put out. That's a lifesaver. I mean, those are far, you know, few and far between. You don't find the case where you really reverse or cure any diseases, but this has given us a very powerful tool in the armament of medicine that we never had before. And we're on the precipice of really minimizing chronic diseases and letting people live a healthy lifespan, if not a longer lifespan. Right. So when a person comes into you, how, mm -hmm. what do you do? What? Well, when a person comes into me in their first appointment, I do a very thorough history, physical exam, um, body impedance scale. And when I say body impedance scale, I mean height, weight, body mass index. But people focus on that. And mm. they talk about um, BMI all the time. What's my BMI? What's my weight? And they miss the point. It's not about that. What it's really about is it's about fat, fat percent, 
visceral fat, the fat mm-hmm. that's around your organs, um, muscle mass, total body water, give you a sense of dehydration or not. Mm-hmm. And these are the elements that are very important when you're talking about body composition. And you want to know these because what makes you obese is not your BMI, but it's actually your excess body fat. Mm -hmm. And so people who are not obese, but have high body fat, in other words, their weight is normal range in the BMI, are what we refer to as thin on the outside, fat on the inside. And they aren't as lucky as the people who are obese. And I know that sounds funny, but the truth of it is that Tofi's don't know that they need to lose body fat and they need to get fit. So this is just really exciting to be able to look at that. And then I write a script for labs and we go over that. And then the next appointment is usually two to four weeks later. And we talk about the um, lab results and we talk about lifestyle modifications, why they're important and what they are specifically to the patient. Now, in terms of labs, I look at labs differently, even though I can order mainstream labs, which I do, and I can order some others. I use a mainstream house, either LabCorp or Quest or whatever it happens to be. But I look at the lab ranges differently, and I look at them for the optimal, not just for within normal limits. So in other words, let me give you an example. So when you're looking at white blood cells, Mm -hmm. and the range is 3.8 to 10.8, Right. And someone's white blood cell is 6.5. I don't say, okay, you're great. I say, you can get this down to below 3.8. And why is this important? Because it's a nondescript indicator of inflammation. And so you should be able to get, and you should be able to go for that. And so when you look at these numbers, and when you look at urine pH, you can do the same thing. When you look at bicarb, you can say the alkalinity, you want it higher. And the range is like 21 to 29 or 19 to 29 depends on the lab. Well, you want it 32 to 34 because now you can be more alkaline and the risk of having reflux disease goes way down. Or when you do have reflux disease and the bicarb goes up, you know that the reflux disease has been solved. Or when you have something like diabetes and you want to avoid renovascular disease, which is heart disease of the Mm -hmm. kidneys by having higher bicarb and being more alkaline, you can protect those kidneys. Awesome. Awesome. Because I love that. I'm I'm a chemistry teacher, so I love hearing this. So Right, right. So what you're looking for is optimal health, not are you within normal limits? What is normal limits? And when you look at a cholesterol profile, for instance, Mm -hmm. you look at it and you say to people, well, my triglycerides are less than 150. Well, good for you, but that's high normal. And so they should be less than 100 ideally, and even less than that. So if you can get them down further, you're lowering the risk of sugars and lowering the risk of cardiovascular disease because triglycerides in itself is an independent risk factor for this. Well, did your medical training prepare you for treating people through nutritional medicine and lifestyle interventions? That's a really good question. And If you're looking at it from the perspective, let's go backwards. If you're looking at it from my fellowship, I did three-year fellowship with Dr. Joel Furman, who's really smart and really knows his stuff. And he wrote Eat to Live. And he taught me some wonderful things. And some of the things I got out of it were like he wrote a book and he's written a lot of articles. And what he taught me was always reference everything you write. So in other words, I've written more than 250 plus articles since working with him and everything I write when I write these articles, whether they're in journals or whether they're weekly articles in newspapers, I always put references at the bottom so people know it's evidence-based and I'm not the person with the brain. I'm the conduit for the research. So I say that I have no brain, but I'm a conduit for research. And I'm joking about that when I say that, but I analyze the data and I move it forward so that people can understand and put it in layman's terms. Now, so I give that a lot of credit. The fellowship was tremendous. Then in residency, I give residency a lot of credit because I learned how to evaluate studies. When I looked at studies, I didn't take them at face value. They taught me how to break apart studies and how to analyze 
a study and not just take it for what it's worth in the face value because not all studies are a good studies and b the references to what they're doing aren't necessarily important for instance i did a study on looking at um a meta-analysis a group of studies um and this was on vitamin e and its impact on cardiovascular disease and this study and we have been using this for years since i graduated from my residency and that people talk about how vitamin E is dangerous at higher levels for cardiovascular disease. Ironically, the higher level had less risk than the lower level. So this was not a well done study and it was not a dose response study. But if you actually looked at the study, it didn't say what people were using it to say. Not to say that you want to put people on vitamin E, but when you looked at it, it said that vitamin E was more dangerous at 1,200 milligrams than it was at 2,000 and more dangerous at 400 milligrams than it was at 800. So it didn't have any rhyme or reason. So it wasn't a very good meta-analysis. And if you've ever seen Ghostbusters, the movie, they say you shouldn't cross the streams. Why? Because it's bad. And when you do meta-analyses, they're very difficult to do because you're taking a whole bunch of studies and that we're not looking at the same endpoints necessarily Mm -hmm. with the same populations and you're crossing them over and you're trying to make sense of that. It speeds up the process in terms of research, but it's not necessarily the gold standard. It confuses the point. Right. Absolutely. As far as um, uh, medical school goes, I had one course in nutrition. And one so course. That, one course. But at least I had one course. Okay. So you see, as it graduated up and up and up, I got more and more exposure. So my residency helped me analyze and my fellowship, well, my fellowship was integrative medicine. Wow. Especially working with Dr. Furman. I mean, wow. Yes. How yes. lucky that was, are you? That's a once in a lifetime opportunity. Oh my God. Right? Right. Right. Wow. I learned so many things that are invaluable. Wow. Well, what is your thoughts on, on medications? I mean, do you still prescribe them? Well, that's interesting. I believe that medications are a good thing when used wisely. I think that medications are needed for short term. I think that they help bridge the gap. I think that you can't say that um, all medicines are bad. I think that some people will always remain on medicines, but that you can get them down. You can change them to lesser medicines with uh, fewer side effects. But when it comes to medications, most of the package inserts um, for what the medicines got approved for are based on between six months and two years of data. So we get into danger when we have patients on medications and we leave them on medications for 30 years. So for instance, let's take an example. Proton pump inhibitors like Prilosec that's over the counter or Nexium that's over the counter. Have you heard of these? Oh, absolutely. Okay. So When I was, before I went to medical school, I was a pharmaceutical rep and I was on a launch drug for HIV. And this launch drug, I remember having a a guy present to us and he told us that proton pump inhibitors had the cleanest profile for a reflux disease and that there were no side effects. And compared to HIV, it was nothing. It was easy. It was the greatest drug. Now, fast forward about 20 years. Now, We look at proton pump inhibitors and we see that when we've had these people on proton pump inhibitors for 20 years, we now see B12 deficiencies. We now see fractures because of leaching of calcium out of the bone. We now see absorption problems. But even worse, there's now a small side effect. It's a 25% increase in risk. Now, it was a small event rate, but a 25% increase in risk in a small side effect that only happens once. It's called death. So when people are on small, you know, death, you know, it's one of those things that'll never hurt you again. Right. But but you won't be coming back either. So proton pump inhibitors are not good things. Right. They're not good things, especially for long term. They were meant for the patient to use for two to four weeks and for the doctor to use for four to six weeks and then reassess. We seem to have left them on that. And the same thing happens with many other medications. And it could be used for, for instance, there's another medication for diabetes. If you leave the patient on for more than three to four years, there's an increased risk of pancreatic cancer. Wow. 
So, I mean, it's not about medicines being good or bad. Medicines have their place and they can be very valuable, but you've got to be very judicious in how you use them. And short term, they're very good. And for bridging the gap when people need them, they're very good. And for getting them on the lowest dose, they're very important. But just to, the, the thing that frustrates me the most is that when people are struggling with cholesterol or have heart disease, doctors will sometimes, and I don't want to mention any doctors or any specialties or anything else because I'm not pointing the finger at anyone specifically. Right. But what I want to say is doctors will sometimes go for the highest dose of statin. And the FDA even told us, don't start people on the highest dose. And if you don't have to use it, don't use it because it can cause all these problems with leg pain and muscle pain and increased diabetes risk and these problems with memory issues and on and on. And yet you'll still see them on very high doses. So what you want to do is if they're on medications, you want to go low, you want to start slow and go low is the phrase. Start slow and go low. And somehow we've lost that. And when I was in medical school, that was the phrase that they always taught us, which is start at the lowest dose and don't move it up very quickly. Go slowly and see how the patient reacts. Because everybody, not everybody, but everybody is different. Clearly. Absolutely. Well, on your website, one of your articles really caught my attention. Just one? Just one. Well, there's several. There was quite a few, actually. But this one in particular really, you know, just made my antennas go up. Woo! Okay. okay. And it is, where do we stand on calcium supplements? So okay. this is kind of a controversial topic. So I wanted to hear what you had to say about this. Well, you're putting me in the hornet's nest I am. because it is one of the trickiest questions to answer. It is. And it's trickier than you think. And the reason is that when I order supplements for people or I, I ask them to take supplements, so I don't actually sell supplements. So I don't want to be biased by supplements. And so when I tell people to take a supplement, it's based usually on a deficiency that they have either from the lab or from some kind of side effect where they need it because of a medication like CoQ10, you take it with a statin because a, a statin will lower your CoQ10 levels in your body. So, but it usually comes from a lab. So that when the levels are low, you give them that supplement. So if you have low magnesium, you give them the magnesium. Or if you have anemia, megaloblastic anemia, where you need B12, you give them B12. Or if you might have tingling and numbness, and then it turns out that your B12 is low or your methylmalonic acid is low, even though the B12 isn't low, you still need to give them B12. You look at the levels, but with calcium, it's different because you never know what the levels really are because the levels n almost never go low. And the reason the levels almost never go low is that if they do start to go low, you have a gland called the parathyroid gland that releases calcitonin, which causes, or actually the parathyroid hormone, which causes, not calcitonin, sorry about that, the parathyroid hormone, which causes release of calcium into the blood or resorption of bone into the blood. And so you release that calcium. So you never really know what the level of calcium is. And calcitonin does the opposite. Calcitonin actually puts calcium back into the bone. So it's the parathyroid hormone that releases calcium into the blood. And that parathyroid hormone gets higher as the calcium in your blood gets lower. So you never really know if someone's deficient in calcium because the parathyroid fools you into thinking they're fine and that you never know until it's too late and they have osteoporosis. Now, in terms of calcium, why are we using calcium supplements? Why would you use a, why would you take a calcium supplement? Can you answer that, Gene? What would be the number one reason? That you have a low deficiency. Right. But also you want to prevent fractures. Bone right. Fractures. Osteoporosis. I mean, down right. the road. You want to prevent osteoporosis or bone fractures. Right. Well, there was recently a study that says that calcium doesn't prevent fracture. Calcium and vitamin D together don't prevent fracture. Even though vitamin D helps absorb calcium through the intestines, it doesn't 
prevent fracture and combination. So it may not work. This was one study, but it may not work. And now it's really put ripples into the idea of what are you using calcium for? And then as far as that's just the efficacy and you want it to be effective, but the side effects, there have been study after study that have shown that it may increase the risk of a heart attack for men and women. And there are different studies showing that. And that's the article you're referencing. That's the article that I wrote and talked about how calcium can increase the risk of heart attacks. And what happens is you can actually get deposits of calcium in the blood vessels. So, wow. so that's that going to narrow the arteries and then speed up, you know, when the blood's flowing over. Right? Potentially, we don't know exactly. We do coronary artery calcium scores now. We're just starting to do them, but we really mm-hmm. don't know the exact meaning of them because calcium plaques are much harder than typical atherosclerosis plaques. Right. So that we don't know if they break off or we don't know how they work. But yes, potentially they can narrow. We don't know the answer to that. But we do know that calcium has the potential to increase the risk of a heart attack. So how do I feel about calcium? I feel like we should get calcium mostly from food, foods that contain calcium. And when it comes to supplements, fortified foods like soy milk with calcium uh, fortified or some other foods that are fortified with calcium, that's like taking a calcium supplement. That doesn't count as food that naturally has calcium in them. So when we think of foods that naturally have calcium in them, we think of dark green leafy vegetables like kale and collards and bok choy and those things. And then we think of beans, navy beans, and uh, all different types of beans that uh, uh, black eyed peas was what I was trying to think of. And that's a legume. But of course, that also has plenty of calcium in them. And then fruits, believe it or not, have calcium in them like oranges and figs, things that we really love. So it's not a painful thing to get calcium from food and nuts and seeds have calcium in them like almonds, sunflower seeds have calcium in them. So you can get lots of calcium from your food. But interestingly, when it comes to calcium, getting it from broccoli and spinach is not the best source because broccoli and spinach have oxalates, which um, block some of the absorption. So you get half as much absorption from broccoli and spinach. I just thought I'd throw that in there for you. Thank you. Uh, I'm always learning. So, and then, and then one more, I'm sorry. No, just keep going. It, it I'm learning just, so much. It was just because you threw this twist in there. The <laughs> levels that we tell people who are 50 and over to take are about 1200 milligrams. And it used to be 1200 milligrams in supplement form. And they used to take 1200 milligrams all at once. Now, the um, Institute of Medicine, and I know it's changed its name, and I think it's the Academy of Medicine. I'm not sure what the current name is, but it used to be the IOM, and it changed it last year or the year before. They've now said that we should get most of that calcium from food. Interestingly, when I look at patients that come to me, the first thing I do is I look at their supplements, and I see that a lot of patients are on 1,200 milligrams of supplement for calcium. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about that is we can only absorb 500 milligrams at any one time. So the other 700 milligrams get either excreted or worse, deposited in your arteries. Wow. So people should never be on 1,200 milligrams or 1,000 milligrams or even 800 milligrams or 600 milligrams because you can't absorb it. Yet you see it on the shelves all the time. So this is tough for patients to know. And then now there's also different countries like England has an upper limit for calcium that we need of 700. So we don't necessarily need 1200. That number came from studies that were about three weeks long in the 1970s. So we need more better studies. We need better studies and we need calcium from natural sources because calcium from natural sources is never going to hurt you. Right. Well, you, you, meant, you made a comment back about a study that said, you know, the, the vitamin D and along with the calcium. And mm-hmm. you said that was not together. Those didn't handle the fractures. Right. And what did the, the study find, find that did? 
Well, it wasn't about what found that it did. It was about what it found that these two didn't. didn't. Yes, okay. it was more about the surprise that it didn't. And so this wasn't a search to find out what worked. It was a surprise that it didn't work because we expected it to work. And so we were surprised when it didn't. Well, so. what about vitamin D supplementation? Because we're, we're, in the, we're in the northern part. We don't get sunshine. I mean, a lot of us are not outside. Okay. About vitamin D supplementation, it's a really good question. But the um, problem is, is it the vitamin D that's the problem when we have all these diseases? Or is the vitamin D just happens to be low when people have these diseases? Which came first, the low vitamin D or the disease? Because when we replete the vitamin D, nothing seems to help that disease. Let me give you an example. If you have MS, multiple sclerosis, mm -hmm. an autoimmune disease, you want people to have 40 uh, milligrams per deciliter of vitamin D, a blood level of 40 or more. And what you find is when you replete that level to 40 or more, they don't do any better. The multiple sclerosis patients, it doesn't mm -hmm. help them at all. What you find is it's very hard to replete it because of the autoimmune disease, but it doesn't actually help them. Right. So where is vitamin D beneficial? We're not quite sure at this point. We know that people are deficient in it. We know that people have insufficiency. And when I say deficiency, it's less than 20. But when I say, um, and it's nanograms, sorry, nanograms per milliliter, not uh, milligrams. Sorry about that. I made a mistake on the uh, findings, but it's nanograms per milliliter. But when you find people that are less than 20, they have deficiency. And that's when you need to give them vitamin D, definitely. When they have 20 to 30, it's questionable whether you need to give them vitamin D or not because that's insufficiency. And then when they have 30 and above, you don't necessarily need to give them vitamin D unless, of course, they might have autoimmune disease or they might have depression where you want higher levels. However, the upper limit should be around 50, 55. And I went to a conference at uh, Harvard several years in a row, about five years in a row. And I raised my hand at the first conference because they said that uh, you should give them vitamin D. And I said, what's the upper limit? And there are 500 of my colleagues in the audience. And I thought to myself very timidly, what's the upper limit? And they said, there is no upper limit. The sky's the limit. There's no downside to giving a lot of vitamin D. Next year, I go back and I ask, What's the upper limit for vitamin D? Because at this point, I knew from Dr. Furman, Joel Furman, that the upper limit from people who are found naturally to have vitamin D, the highest levels, was about 55. And that was someone in Hawaii or someone who was exposed to sun all the time close right. to the equator. So then they said, oh, well, it should be 100. And then the year after, I went back and I asked the same question. And they said, well, it should be less than 60. And then I went the year after and they said, well, 50 to 55. And so the range has remained between 30 and 55. But I thought it was ironic because it came down and it came down and it came down. But the first time I asked the question, it was like the sky's the limit. So what do we know about vitamin D? That a lot of us are insufficient. Some of us are deficient in it. And how much do we need? Well, we don't need to give 50,000 IUs every week to get it up really fast. Mm -hmm. We can give a thousand IUs and people will get that number up. You don't need to give an elephant gun to get it up really fast. It's not critical care in order to get that number up. And if you have something called sarcoidosis, which people don't realize, you shouldn't take vitamin D at all because it can cause the lymph nodes in your lungs to get inflamed from the vitamin D. Wow. Hylar lymph nodes. So, you know, vitamin D isn't the panacea we thought it was going mm -hmm. to be. Wow. Okay. Well, another article that caught my attention, because this hits home for me, most of my family is obese. And the article was, can you be obese and be healthy? So take it away. The, the short answer for that question is... Well, the short answer is no, and, I'm, and I don't mean to disappoint, but the short answer is no, but I want to qualify that. And what I mean by qualifying that is you can have obesity and 
get metabolically much healthier. So in other words, I've seen patients and I've had plenty of patients who have diabetes and have gotten their A1Cs, which are their three-month sugars, down to lower levels that are non-diabetic levels, reversed their diabetes, gotten off four different meds, and that can be insulin included, and reversed their diabetes, but they may not have lost as much weight as they should have in terms of what we should say. Well, weight loss is most important. And the same thing can be said for in cancer. It frustrates me because it seems like, and I don't mean to pick on one group, but if I were going to, it would be oncologists. They seem to think that weight loss is the only thing that's important in cancer. And the truth of it is weight loss is just one element, but this is not on not all oncologists, of course. When you generalize, you assume and you make a fool of yourself. Right. But of course, but I was presenting in front of oncologists about all the benefits of how to reduce the inflammation. And what they got out of it was, okay, so you can lose weight and that's the only thing we've got from it. And then this was the chairman of the department. And I said, well, thank you for sharing that. And in the last three minutes, I recapped what was really important, but they didn't get it. And so I have a patient or I've had several patients who have had high inflammation levels like they had ovarian cancer and their CA-125 was 10 times normal. And we were able to bring it down to normal levels by reducing the inflammation. And then the cancer people said, oh, look, see, the drugs are working. And it may be the case, but when I looked at the package insert about the drugs, they talked nothing about reducing the inflammation because it didn't show that. And when it, they did try to show the inflammation reduction, there was none. There was, in this one drug I was looking at, it was an immunotherapy that had one out of 64 patients saw a reduction in their inflammatory marker. So you can tell me that I've had patients, every patient I've had with cancer who's had reduction in um, inflammatory markers, that's that one out of 64. I don't think I'm that lucky. I've um, played the lottery and I've never won. So, and I've never won any other lottery thing. So I've never tried to play again, but I'm not that lucky to have just those patients. Right, right, wow. Well, how about microbiomes and the gut? How does that work with obesity? Oh, wait. And so, so just to go back to, okay. um, to, the to go back question. to obesity for a second. Yep. What I wanted to point out, I've had people where they've had diabetes and I had a patient who said to me, I followed everything you said, a whole foods plant-based diet. And I lost 18 pounds in a month. And you say, wow, that's great. And her A1C, which was nine, which is high, you want for reversal of um, diabetes to be pre-diabetes, you want it to be 6.5 or lower. And when it comes to medicines, you want it to be lower than seven. Total reversal, you want it to be less than 5.7 or 5.6. And hers was nine. And so she did everything I told her to do. And her A1C went up to 9.6, even though she lost 18 pounds. Why was that the case? When I asked her, she said, yes, I'm having the Chinese food you told me I could have. And I said, okay, are you putting the sauce on it or are you having it steamed with the sauce on the sides and drizzling it? And she said, I had it on it. And I said, there's your problem. It's basking in sugar and salt. And so and that's oil. what created, right. And oil and of course fat, right. And that's what created the A1C to go up. But she didn't, you know, this is someone who lost 18 pounds, but yet had a negative effect metabolically, whereas other people have had very positive effects metabolically and may have not lost the weight as of yet. So, so it's really interesting. So you can still be obese and be metabolically healthy, but at the same time, the AMA, the American Medical Association, has qualified obesity in 2014, I think it was, as a chronic disease. And the reason for that is that obesity has inflammatory markers. So they have something called adipokines. Adipo means fat and kinds means messengers. So they talk to each other, but it creates inflammation throughout the body. So when you get arthritis because you're obese, it's not just because of the pressure you put on your knees or your hips, 
but it's the inflammatory factors that cause the inflammation, localized inflammation. So obesity in itself can cause all these problems. Right. So that's yeah. why you want to lose the weight. Absolutely. Well, and speaking of weight, we, my partner and I, were the starch queens, and we have a weight loss program to help people to and it's not just a weight loss program. It's more of an educational program because we teach people about all the different fast facets of a plant-based diet and how to change. And, you know, we talk about psychological issues, you know, addiction, food addiction. So what advice can you give to a person who's just, you know, to prepare them mentally, physically, emotionally, how, how to change to a plant-based diet? When you talk to them emotionally, physically, how do you get them to understand how to change? You want to talk about, first you want to focus on that. I had mentioned this before, but I think I jumped into some other ideas that you may have had. I think I was prescient. I mentioned internal motivators. There was a study at uh, using cadets from West Point. And what they did was they looked at the cadets who had internal motivation and their internal motivation was to be a good soldier. And that's not figuratively, that's literally. Mm -hmm. And then they had another group whose internal motivation, whose motivation was to be a high ranking officer. And that's an external motivator. And then those people who had the external motivation quit after two to three years because they didn't become high ranking officers. But the people who had internal motivation became high-ranking officers as an external consequence of being a good soldier. So if you have an internal motivator, like for instance, weight loss is not a good internal motivator. But what is a good internal motivator is, can I get my life back? Will I have more energy? Will I have a healthy lifespan? Will I be able to play with my kids? Will my pain go away? Will I get over my depression or anxiety where food and mood have a relationship? Will I be able to be able to play and not have chest pain and worry about the fact that I might be having a heart attack because I have heart disease? You know, can I go out and jog without having to worry that I'm having a heart attack right on the path? So, I mean, those are internal motivators and those really give people a leg up as to what they need to do in order to have a good quality of life. But it's, it's, it's that internal motivation that gets them to do what they need to do. But and, I've never heard it called the internal motivator. Thank you yeah, for that. Yeah. We call it, you have to know your why. Yeah, it's the same thing. It's knowing right. your why. But your knowing your why comes from within. Right. And it's only from within and it's your why. You can give people suggestions. Okay, here's a list of 10 internal motivators. Pick one or come up with your own. Right. But at least, and then use that mantra when you see foods to say, will this help me with my energy? And instead of saying, will this help me with my energy? Every time you see food, energy, food, energy, you know, that way you have this mantra or you say, is this good for my energy? At least you have a mantra. And now it's almost like a meditation. And then you say, is this food harmful? Or is this food beneficial? You never say, is this food good or is this food bad? Because when we say bad, we sometimes want to be bad. We want to take the top off from the car. Um, and, that's, <laughs> and then you think something else. But we're talking about the top of a car, okay? And we want to sit on the edge of the car and we want to scream and not wear our seatbelts when we're going 10 miles an hour. I don't want it to be too reckless. Okay. Remember, I'm still a doctor. Or we want to take our hands off the uh, handlebars for a bicycle. Or we want to, you know, do something crazy, you know, fun and crazy and just run around screaming or something like that. And that's being bad, but bad sometimes in a good way. You don't want to associate food with good and bad because that's emotions. Right. And bad means sometimes I want to be bad because I'm upset. Or sometimes I want to be bad because I had a bad day. Right. Emotional Food, eating. Right. Emotional no. eating. It leads to emotional eating. Yeah. And what you want is it not to be an addiction and not to be a drug. And so instead, you want to think of it not as an addiction, but rather just like a drug, you wouldn't take a drug that's harmful. You would take a drug that's only beneficial. Right. Beneficial. Good. That's a good one. Uh 
Thank you. I learned on that one. Good. Should a person tell their doctor if they're going to start a plant-based diet? Um, I think people should tell uh, their doctor whenever they make any kind of change like that. A plant-based diet is a dramatic change. Uh, and hopefully the doctor will understand what that means with a plant-based diet. They need to know because there are drug interactions with food. Yeah. And for instance, let me give you an example. When I was the pharmaceutical rep, before I was doing the HIV drug, I sold cardiovascular dr drugs and one of them was Coumadin or Warfarin. Yes. And when you eat dark leafy greens, it causes warfarin to go down in efficacy. So it's not beneficial anymore. You're losing benefit by eating dark leafy greens. Now, isn't that sick that a drug... I know. You, you can't eat dark leafy greens with a drug, right? Why would that be? That's crazy, right? So you shouldn't eat any dark leafy greens when you have Coumadin, correct? Or right. warfarin. Right. Well, that's actually not correct. I just pulled you into the rabbit hole. Uh, <laughs> No, you should, because I know Dr. Robert Otzfeld, and he knows. The Alice in Wonderland, yes. Right. The Alice in Wonderland of the medical rabbit hole. Now I know. But uh, you can. You just have to keep raising the level of Coumadin or Warfarin. Sorry for using the term Coumadin, but I sold it when it was brand name and not uh, generic. All you have to do is raise the levels. And I know that sounds crazy, but if you keep eating greens, dark leafy greens, which have vitamin K in it, you just raise the level of warfarin. And I've had patients as a medal um, to what they're doing and as a badge of honor, they keep raising the level of Coumadin, which means their dark leafy greens have gone up and up and up. So their nutrient levels have gone up. So as their Coumadin goes up, so does their nutrient levels. And I'm working with cardiologists on this with several patients, and they think it's great because then the patient can't stop eating the same amount of greens because then they'll be over-medicated. So the patient always has, has to, to keep up with the, the greens. So in some ways, yeah. metaphorically, we should all be on a blood thinner like Coumadin, but <laughs> oh, gladly we're not. Thank but goodness, metaphorically, yes. We should be on a blood thinner like Coumadin, right. but uh, we're not. And so in a way, um, there's interactions with drugs. So we have to know that. Well, Another like, thing, or heart, you know, if you have high blood pressure. Yes. And, and that, or if you're diabetic, my gosh. Right. Right. If you're di I was going to say, if you're diabetic or you have high blood pressure and you start going on a plant-based diet and you reduce the amount of sodium and you put in the plant-based, which helps with the endothelial dysfunction of your arteries, that's the internal part of your artery. If that changes and the stiffness starts to go away, then your blood pressure goes down. You need to cut that blood pressure medication mm -hmm. immediately, which means you need to take your home blood pressure and tell your doctor. Or in the case of diabetes, you need to show that if you're doing this, you can get off insulin or you can get off oral hypoglycemics. And if you don't, sometimes you go into hypoglycemia where your sugars drop like a rock. And so you don't want to cause problems where people are on the floor because you gave them a plant-based diet. So yes, well, it's very important. How soon are we talking? How soon? How soon can you see these effects? How soon can you see these effects? It depends on the patient, but you can see these effects in a week or two. You can start seeing these effects in two weeks. I mean, I've seen patients drop their cholesterol by 150 points in two weeks. Yeah. I've seen their blood pressure drop dramatically to normal levels where I had to cut their blood pressure in a week. It can be a week. It can be two weeks. But again, no body is the same. So let's yes. not hold anybody to two, one to two weeks. I mean, typically, it is usually four to six weeks. But some people can do this very fast. And the more they adapt right. the change in a plant-based diet, it can be really quick. It can be almost as quick as medications. But it can have more of a resounding effect than mm -hmm. medications. And the side effects are beneficial. Yeah. Or you might lose weight. Oh, my God. <laughs> I know. This is the other thing about weight. If you start losing weight and you don't tell your doctor you're on a plant-based diet, they're going to start freaking out because they're not going to know that it's not weight loss that didn't happen on purpose. So they're going to think it was you're involuntary sick. weight loss and they're going to think you're sick. You're going to think yeah. cancer. Let me give you an example of a patient who didn't tell their doctor. 
my patient changed their diet and was great. And she's wonderful. And she has one of the highest nutrient levels and she's doing really well. Well, her grandson, she started to give a smoothie, a plant-based smoothie to, And then, and she told the parents and the parents took the grandson to the pediatrician and the pediatrician had really high carotene levels. And the pediatrician was really concerned because he thought, oh, he's got hepatitis. He's, he's got all these problems with his gallbladder. He's got all these problems. When he's turning orange, he's turning yellow, he's turning, you know, and he's becoming jaundice. So we need to do something. And he wanted to run all these tests. And <laughs> my patient said, remember, he's drinking the smoothie. And that's yeah. what it is. You know, right. Time out. Exactly. Time yeah. out. He's drinking this procedure. Don't do all these procedures on him. Don't make him go through. A- they wanted him to go through a CT exam. They wanted to check his belly. They wanted to do all these different invasive right. procedures because they were freaking out over that number. And then the parents explained to him it was because of his diet. So there's <laughs> reasons you need to tell people. Just, I have a story for you. My stepdaughter oh. had... Um, she had issues. She's very thin, tiny, petite. And she was standing outside waiting for the school bus. And she was starting to have all these issues with her hands. And they went to the doctors. And, oh, my God, all these problems. And they were doing all these tests on her. And they were saying, oh, my God, it could be this. It could be this. It could be that. I mean, they were going all over the place. The nurse, who is from England, said she has, has chill blains. Put gloves on. Wow. You know, and wow. I mean, and, and I, my husband was saying how, how scared they were for like months on end. Right, right, right. Months. Because everybody thinks it's these rare diseases exactly. or it's these dangerous diseases or it's Raynaud's. I mean, I've touched patients and my hands are cold in the winter at times. Sometimes they're cold because the water I'm using is cold when I'm washing my hands. Right. So they're like, do you have Raynaud's? And I said, no, I have something called body heat conservation where all my body goes where all my heat goes to the central portion of my body so i get cold very infrequently and then that means that my extremities are cold but the rest of my body is not and i feel much more comfortable so i don't have rain notes but they're very quick to want to diagnose me and i think it's very nice of them to want to diagnose me <laughs> we diagnose them but it, and it's very caring of them but you know i just right. want to explain to them that no i don't have these things well, it goes back and forth <laughs> Another concern well, people might have is a fear that they're going to become protein deficient. Yes. What are your thoughts on this? My thoughts are, ah! <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Everybody <laughs> talks about protein. I know. <laughs> and the thing is, the thing that they're missing is that protein, when they refer to protein, what are they referring to? Right. What are they referring to, I ask you? Well, my question I usually ask them is, do you even know how much protein you're supposed to have? Yeah, well, what are they referring to when they're referring to the protein? They're referring to animal protein. Right. The definition is protein means animal. And it doesn't... Well, that's in their head. Right. It doesn't mean animal. And we've been so ingrained to believe that animal protein is what where we get protein. And why do we need protein? I don't know, because someone said we need protein, and I don't know where it came from. Because we've been marketed to. Right. And we've been told that we need eight glasses of water a day. But do we really? No. But... You know, I mean, it, it comes to this. Do we need animal protein? Not necessarily. And plant protein is a much purer form of protein. And it doesn't put, for instance, pressure on your kidneys. So, for instance, if you have somebody with chronic kidney disease and they're eating animal protein, it'll make their chronic kidney disease potentially worse because it has phosphorus in it. Both have nitrogenous waste, both plant and animal protein. But animal protein has phosphorus, which can damage the kidneys. Even if you don't have chronic kidney disease, you still don't want to be damaging the kidneys. If you eat animal protein, it increases the inflammation. And we know that inflammation is the basis of 80 plus percent of chronic diseases. So if you want chronic disease, please, by all means, have animal protein. And then, of course, there's different quality of animal protein. There's processed meats, which the WHO has qualified as a class one carcinogen. Yeah. But I'm not saying that people have to give up all their animal protein if they don't want to. But you want to eat a plant-based diet. And if you're going to have animal protein, it shouldn't be more than about 10%. But if you're still going to have it, then have it at most once a day. And that's 
not a great thing to have it once a day. It's much better to be healthy and not have plant protein. But if you're going to have it, have it occasionally. But trying to just take away animal protein from people. And I know that Neil Bernard, his group is wonderful. PCRM has done such wonderful things for animals and has been vegan, vegan, vegan. And I think that's great. And I, I can't mention how proud I am to be associated with them. And I give them a shout out and I think they're wonderful. But as far as it goes with Neil Bernard and his plant-based group, plant-based doesn't necessarily mean vegan. And oh, absolutely. Big I was difference. working and I was working with if I can interrupt just for one second, that is a very cute dog. <laughs> <laughs> I had a crazy. golden retriever. That's crazy. Retriever. That's her Grace, spot, you're as you can cute. tell. Yes, you're very cute. You were a little shy coming in, but then you got to your spot. <laughs> she did. So, but anyway, so as far as it goes, I've one of my patients, uh, he told me I could tell people this, is Br- Brooklyn Borough President, Eric Adams. And his mother is also my patient. And I'm very proud of them for how well they've done. But, well, you knew I was coming. I had, I had just had to ask you about them. Well, so, <laughs> so but, amazing. But, but what they did, you know, I had to explain to Eric Adams how vegan is great, but of course, there's unhealthy vegan and there's healthy vegan. Yes. And unhealthy vegan, there was a study done that showed that unhealthy vegan was just as bad, if not worse, for coronary heart disease th- than eating meat. Right. All the time. And so you want healthy vegan. And that goes the same way for gluten free. If you want to be gluten free, have a gluten free diet that doesn't strip the gluten from the products. Have a gluten free diet that never had gluten in the first place. Exactly. My problem is when you get to products that they call themselves gluten free because they took out the fiber and the protein. So, but then they put in other stuff. Right. But then they put in other stuff. But you talk about, vegan and not vegan. And I had to explain to Eric, who is vegan, that not everybody's going to want to be vegan. And that's one of the last things they want to give up. So you want to bend so that you don't lose them and they change their lives. And then you can work on the vegan aspect of it from many different aspects. But the ironic thing was that he saw it with his mother. He saw it with his mother. She didn't want to give up the animal protein. And he looks at me and he goes, I see what you're talking about. So when you see patients and I see many, many patients and I have over a thousand of my own patients and I worked with lots of Dr. Joel Furman's patients, but when I've seen many patients, I know that that's one of the last things that you see go. And so you don't want to dissuade the patient from coming to you by telling you, by telling them that you're any one thing and, you know, and getting them off it and explaining that's great. But if they'll do certain things and they get their inflammation down and you get them healthier with a whole foods plant-based diet because they're eating predominantly whole foods plant-based diet, work with them. And so you want to do that. But as far as I feel like we got off topic and this is going to hurt your editing, sorry (laughs) about that. But this is so interesting to talk to you and you're so easy to talk to. So, you know, you're adding to the... You're, you're, you're throwing fuel on my fire. I am. I am. You, well, and one you of the things going back to the protein, because I talk to people a lot about this a lot, because we don't, you know, you, you've got to get rid of it. If you're consuming too much protein, you've got to get rid of it. And it's coming through your kidneys. And then I take a sidestep and go, okay, let's take a, a field trip. Next time you go into a, a box pharmacy, go down an aisle. This aisle has grown tremendously. And that's adult diapers. Right. It started out with a small area and now it's a whole aisle. Right. Go look. That you don't see that. You I mean you I mean you you see this whole line of adult diapers because it's not normal to become incontinent as you get older. It's not normal. But we're seeing so much of it now because the baby boomers are now hitting their seventies. Right. And And they were the generation. Yes. Right. And they were the generation with protein. And you know why the protein? I just realized why the protein. It had to do with World War II. Yeah, right after World War II. And the rationing. Exactly. And so it became something of a a plus when you could get 
protein. Chicken in every pot. Protein. Right. Chicken in every pot meant you were rich. Exactly. Meant you were nutrient dense and you were not. You were yeah. just dense. <laughs> um, sorry, I had to throw that in. Good but, one. Um, that was a good but, one. Good one. Thank you. But my, it's really not following the protein that's important. What's yeah. important is following the fiber. Everything yes. that has fiber has protein. Everything that has protein doesn't have fiber. And we don't ask the question, are you deficient in fiber? Well, most Americans have about 8 to 14 grams of fiber a day. Yeah. Yeah. The ADA, the American, Diabe uh, American Dietetic Association, sorry, I'm in my world and I have to switch over to both worlds. That's what's integrative. It's like switching languages. The American Dietetic Association says yeah. that women should get 40 grams of uh, should get 25 grams of, of fiber a day, 25 right. grams of fiber. We have no way of measuring that exactly, except that they will eat the 25 grams and that men should get 40 plus grams of fiber a day. And I say, bull hunky, women and men should both get 40 plus grams of fiber a day. You can right. never get enough fiber a day. Yeah. And it's not about having soluble or insoluble fiber. It's about just having good quality fiber that comes from fruits, vegetables, beans, legumes, nuts, and seeds. To, uh, it's to a some moving extent, experience. Right. And to some extent from <laughs> grains. Yeah. But I mean, that's where you want to get the fiber. And Neil Bernard has a t-shirt that fiber is the new protein. And I was saying this even before Neil Bernard had that t-shirt, and I got that t-shirt from a couple of years ago, but I was saying this before, which is that follow the path of the, pro of, of the fiber, not the protein, because right. fiber has nutrients. Right. Fiber reduces the inflammation. Fiber creates bulk in your stool so you don't have constipation. Fiber reduces colon cancer. Fiber reduces the risk of colorectal cancer, but not only that, there have been studies that show that fiber can actually treat colon cancer. And no calories. Right. And no calories. Yeah. So fiber can actually treat colon cancer. I mean, this is, this is amazing stuff. We're not even just saying prevention with um, fiber. Right. So, I mean, and fiber can also bring down your sugars. I mean, fiber and bring down your inflammation. Fiber can do all these wonderful things. And guess what comes with fiber? Protein. And nutrients. And nutrients, exactly. Well, fiber is a nutrient. So, right, exactly. So when you think of protein, you should be saying, I would say, instead right. of where's the beef, remember that commercial? It should Absolutely. be where's the bun. Absolutely, that little old where's lady. Right. It should be where's the bun, <laughs> except it really shouldn't be where's the bun. But, oh, my you God, know, no, that's disgusting. That's right, stuff. exactly, exactly. But it shouldn't be where's the beef. Because that's no. not what we're looking for here. Right. We're looking for the fiber. We're looking for substances with the fiber and not without the fiber. Well, do you recommend any supplements for people following a plant-based lifestyle? Well, with a whole foods plant-based, and why I keep saying whole foods is that um, I think it's a very do good tell. term. Do tell. I think that you can get away with plant-based diet not being, let's go back to the fact that it might not be healthy. And just because it's plant-based doesn't mean it's healthy, but a whole foods plant-based diet gives it a sense of either you think of the uh, grocery store, whole foods, which isn't always healthy because I did presentations at whole foods in the Bowery and in the Bowery, I pulled out products, not cookies, but I pulled out products and not to pick on any products, but some products had more sodium than other products. For instance, Amy's with the enchiladas two servings of enchiladas was like 1200 milligrams yeah. of sodium. And you're supposed to be not more than about 1500 milligrams of sodium or so, you know, and I know the debate goes on, but you want to get sodium from plants rather than added sodium. I have so to we tell you a story. We won't go on that. Sorry, I go ahead. I have to tell you a story. I was in, in Whole Foods in New York City and I went in and one of the things we go in with my stepdaughter when we're in New York City, we go in there and sometimes we'll do shopping together. And of course, me being me, you know, I will start reading labels. So my stepdaughter had picked up some of the kale chips. And I said, for her, because she has, she, she doesn't have weight issues. She's, you know, no health issues. So she's good. So she, she picked up some kale chips. And I, you know, and I'm, I said, for you, this is okay. You know, this is a good, good choice for you. And behind me, was a guy just standing there. And I said, but for me, I can't have this because there's no way, because I'm very, very so sodium sensitive, extraordinarily. I mean, I get blood pressure headaches 
from from sodium. I mean, just in processed foods. I can't right. cannot eat right. it. So anyway, so I started, you know, and I started going on about kale and all the nutrient values. And I was talking, you know, giving my lecture about this. And and this guy goes around and turns around and goes, oh, I'm so glad to hear somebody, you know, promoting my product. And I'm like, this is your product? Really? And and I said, I got a bone to pick with you. Right. <laughs> and I right. started attacking him right in the store. I have no right. shame. Wow. I'm like, yeah, no, no. Sodium, it's way too high. And I'm going right. on about all the other things and issues. No, 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 no. And he's like... Okay, okay, okay. We're coming down. We, we're coming up with a sodium, lower sodium version. And I'm like, how about sodium free? Yeah, the problem with these are that, like kale chips or any kind of vegetable yeah. chips, are that they're wolves in uh, clothing, wolves in yeah. sheep's clothing. I mean, they are wolves in sheep's clothing. Yeah. I mean, they're just as bad as potato chips. They have the oil. Well, they so, have the no, salt. No, but these are oil free because they're dehydrated. Oh, these are oil free. Okay, these you are didn't dehydrated. No, okay. my bad. Okay, but okay. they do have. I mean, they do have like they use like cashews, you know, to, right. to make right. like some of sauce and then right. It but you got to be cashews. careful with the cashews too. Of when course. you look at the label, sometimes they and have a hundred. Right, one hundred forty yeah. calories, and then seventy from fat. And you look at the label. Well, that's, that's of that's what I, said. Chips I just started. The I started going after him like nobody's yeah. business, and he's just like. Good for you. And then I said, oh, by Good the way, you. can I do an interview with you? you know? Good for you. That's great. <laughs> no, That's but I started going right. after him right in the store because I'm like, look at this label. Let's let's talk. Right. You know? And I right. flipped the package around and I started going after him. And he's like, okay, got it. Heard you. Right. But on right. the other hand, I mean, you have to have, because we're so, our palate has been so conditioned, you know, the food is now, my, my husband came up with a great term. He calls it turbocharged. The food is so turbocharged that if it's not, we don't, it's not palatable to us anymore. Right. So it's got to be that high amount of salt, you know, sodium, oil, sugar to make it reach that bliss point you know, right. with us. Right. So what supplements? I never really got to answering your question because we have <laughs> such great conversation. We're having such great conversation. This You're going to have good. a really a lot of fun editing this because this is going to be a pain in the butt. I'm sorry about this, <laughs> this but it's your fault and my fault at the same time. Go, go. Answer I, the I, supplements. I, I think Come we're on. terrible for each other. <laughs> but, I, but in terms of supplements, I don't blindly put people on supplements. Uh -huh. I look at their blood levels before I would tell them to start a supplement, even if it's a vitamin D, maybe even if it's a B12, because you don't want too high a level B12. Some people naturally have higher levels of B12 than you think. Even if you're going vegan, there are a lot of things that are fortified with B12 at this point. And so you want to be careful not to just blindly go, okay, well, take a thousand micrograms of B12 and you'll be fine. And there was a study that's claiming that high B12 in men may increase the risk of cancer, prostate cancer potentially. And I don't know, the study is, you know, is questionable and I don't know if it's going to be this way or not this way. Just like high levels of fish oil can increase the risk of potentially prostate cancer. Nobody's quite sure about that, but we don't know what the effects are and we want to look at this. And the thing about supplements is that supplements, we give something in mega doses and we expect the body to absorb it the same way it would absorb it if it were in food. And we look at it and we go, oh my God. And so you say to yourself, but I'm vegan. I don't want to eat animals, but you can get it from foods that have been fortified and you're going to run into that. So you want to be careful, right? but you still want to be, for instance, there was a study just the other day talking about fish oil and dry eye. And we've been giving fish oil, uh, the triglyceride formulation because it absorbs better to dry eye patients to help them with that situation. And then there was a study just out of the university of Pennsylvania. This is brand new. I'm sharing this with you and it can't be more than two weeks old. And, and what it showed was it had about 250 patients, and I might not be correct exactly on the number, but it was a two to one ratio for the treatment group as opposed to the control group. And in the treatment group, it went up to three grams of fish oil. So we're not talking small levels of fish oil because we lot. wouldn't really give a lot more than three grams. So That's it went lot. all out. It went from like 500 to three, uh, 500 milligrams to three grams. And what it showed was not only disappointing, it was completely frustrating that not 
one test, not even one test suggested that it worked. And this study was, um, I think this study was, I can't remember the duration and that's, um, you can catch me on the duration, but I think this study was, I want to say it was, I, I don't remember the duration and I want to say it's a year, but I can't remember if it's a year. But it was a, a really good study, and it was a randomized controlled trial run by a woman from University of Pennsylvania who is the most stellar woman I've ever met because I did a study with her, and I didn't even know she ran the study. And it was, and then I read it, and I was like, oh my god, this is this can't be more ethical, and this can't be um, better designed because I've seen her at work. And what it showed was that fish oil just doesn't really work in dry eye. And yet we've been pounding the pavement that it does. And we've been giving it to people. And guess what the side effect of fish oil is? One of the side effects. I said, potentially prostate cancer. But more importantly, it uh, not more important than prostate cancer, but more importantly, in terms of being able to show, we know that fish oil can increase the risk of a bleed. Oh. And so if you have someone on Coumadin and fish oil, you're increasing mm. the risk of bleed or warfarin in fish oil or aspirin in fish oil. So you got to be very careful with fish oil. And that's another reason you tell your doctor to go back to that. To because, that part, yeah. Right. Certain, and certain yeah. supplements interact with drugs too. And so you want to be yeah. very careful. So I don't blindly in general write for supplements and I don't sell supplements. And I don't say this because I think there's an ethical issue with other people. I have an ethical issue with it because if I don't sell it and then I tell people to get it, it's a non-biased statement because right. I feel like I'm saying it because they need it, right. not because I think you were and trying one, to sell it. Right. And one patient had 60 supplements and I spent an hour with her on the first appointment. And I thought I was doing a mitzvah because I spent another hour because I tried to take her off some of these supplements, telling her that you didn't need to be on five different forms of fish oil or, you know, 16 different forms of CoQ10 or sent, whatever I it was. Sent, saved you a bunch of money. Right, right, right. And so she called me up the week before her second appointment and said, I have to cancel. And I said, why? Because she said, your mindset is not the same as mine. I want to stay on my supplements. Now, let me give you the backstory to her. What? She started the supplements. Yeah. And then since then, she's had three heart attacks and 16 stents. And she has osteoarthritis where her hip is so bad she can't even walk and she's using a walker. Yet she says the supplement saved her life. <gasps> right. Right. And so she couldn't have me as her doctor because I attempted to take her off her supplements. Not all of them, just started to peel them off saying you don't have to spend and she felt like i was invading her space do so you, you just not want to cry right i did i did i was like you know i really uh -huh. wanted to cry you know i really wanted to cry because i could have helped her and i spent an extra hour with her because i had an extra hour so i did it at the end of the night and i spent that extra hour after i'm exhausted because i felt like i was doing a service and her daughter seemed so encouraging for what i was doing and then I get this call and says, you know, I can't be your patient because oh. you don't believe in my philosophy. And I said, you know, oh my God. and I tried to explain to her, you can stay on your supplements. We'll work around them. I just want to help you reverse heart disease. And she said, no, we can't do this. And I was heartbroken. And this was, this w was one of the few times this has happened to me because when I have patients come to see me, I have a 90 plus percent retention rate in a field that isn't obligatory to go to. Right. And so, and the reason it happens is that people see change. Right. And they see that I look at it a different way, but not, this isn't really, this is integrative medicine. You could call it lifestyle medicine, but this is integrative. And why I say integrative is because there's a lot to do with traditional or co uh, conventional medicine. And then it's integrating with lifestyle, but it's really not even integrative. Right. It's comprehensive medicine. But you can't say that because comprehensive medicine would mean what is everybody else doing? I don't, I don't even want to say that. Uh, but yeah, you see what I'm okay. saying. So I this do. I do. Going I, there, and it, it was it was oh. it was it was really disappointing. And okay, okay, okay. Now you got to share. I've been waiting, saving this one for last. You got to tell the story. Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams. You got to share it. Who? Who? I never heard of him. Stop Who? it. Stop I'm it. sorry. I just had to stop it. Do a little bit of fun yeah. there. 
Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You got it. Because like, yeah, I mean, so, you look at this man, he is like a rock star now. I mean, right, seriously. Right. right. So, so I come can't, on, glow. I can't, glow. I, come on. Okay. So Eric Adams was 50 plus pounds overweight. And, um, he had an A1C that was really high, his three months sugar. He was uh, given insulin and metformin to start. And he never took the insulin because he just was afraid of insulin. And then he did take the metformin for about two weeks, but it made him sick. And it gave him that stomach ache that a lot of people get from metformin. Then you get over it potentially, but he didn't want to get over it. And he was determined to figure out how to do this. And so he had, he was, he said there was blurry vision. He had numbness and tingling in his feet. He had also gone to very smartly. He had read some, I don't want to take full credit for Eric. But I want to say that he went to Dr. Esselstein, Caldwell Esselstein, um, Essie, as everybody refers to him, at one of his seminars for a day and listened to him. And he listened, he read some of uh, Dr. Michael Greger's stuff. Mm -hmm. And so that was wonderful. So I got someone who was a zealot and he really wanted to change and he's done wonderful things and his A1C is um, uh, close to normal, if not normal at this point. And he has no more symptoms and he's lost all the weight and he continues to. And I look at the body analysis and I keep tweaking things. And he's like, this is great. And I'm tweaking things for him and he's getting better and he's getting better and he's getting better. And he just keeps getting more and more excited. And he keeps trying things and he keeps questioning what we're doing and we keep altering and he keeps getting better and he keeps getting better. But now he's like one-tenth of one point away from being non-diabetic on the A1C level. And he says to me, well, why is this this way? And then we we change things around and we explain to him that no body is the same. And he says, well, but if the range is here, why do we want to be over here? And I said, well, Eric, do you want average or do you want optimal? And he says, oh, right. I want optimal. Fair point. and, and we work with him and, and that's what we do. And, and it's a continual process and he's loving it. And every time we do it, he becomes more and more a zealot. And some of my patients are such zealots and Eric is one of them. But let me share another story with you. Well, wait, his mom, he got his mom. Wait, wait, that's the story I was going to share with you as See? well. We're like that's mine. Story, Right, exactly, exactly. Let me do it. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting to it. Now his mom is 79 years old. And the thing is, let me first interject before I say something about his mom. And that is that medicine, conventional medicine, and the reason I don't say traditional medicine is because people told me if I say traditional medicine, it sounds like Chinese medicine or it sounds like um, something out of that. So conventional medicine, whatever you want to call it. But the conventional medicine, I went to a seminar at Harvard and I've done a lot of these and these were great, but the guy who wrote the guidelines was there and he was lecturing and he is from Harvard. And he says, when you get a diabetes patient, put them on metformin. And if they need more at the same time, cause their A1C like Eric is very high, then put them on insulin at the same time. There's nothing wrong with that because insulin's wonderful. And he said, because patients fail the diet. Whereas we used to give them in medical school, I was always taught, give patients three to six months to change their lifestyle. We don't do that anymore. We put them on medication because we believe they'll fail their diet. They can't what's, change. Right. And what's the truth? That's the furthest from the truth. What's the truth? The truth is that physicians fail the patient. And if the physician can't arm the patient with the proper understanding of lifestyle modifications, just telling the patient to eat more fruits and vegetables, well, that's a plus. That's already a step in the right direction. Not even talking about it, that's not the right step. But either being able to have a rudimentary understanding and then be able to refer to physicians who do have a really good understanding, well, there's a step and say, well, why don't you work with them and we'll work with you too and let's see how you can do. That's that's a great way to do it. So it's not that the diet fails. It's not that the patient fails. 
the diet. It's that the physician fails the patient because the physician never gave them the tools or the education to understand how it goes. And why is it so important that the buck stops with the physician? Because the physician gives them their medications, the physician looks at their labs, the physician understands the pathology, the disease, the, they understand the physiology, the body, right. they understand how the other diseases. Many of my patients don't have one chronic disease when they come to see me. Oh on average, God. they have four to six chronic diseases. Absolutely. And they're not on one medication, they tend to be on eight. 10 medications. If not more. If not, oh, of course, I'm being, I'm saying. Being the, generous. I, I, right. I've had some that are on 20 something medications. And if you qualify supplements as some medications, then it goes even higher, but we're not qualifying that. Even though Medicaid, even though supplements really are unregulated medications, just like Tylenol and Advil are over the counter. They're medications. Yeah. You know, and if they were medications in this day, they would have been regulated. Because they can cause danger. You oh, have, absolutely. You have more than you have four grams of Tylenol for more than a week. You can cause your liver to shut down. Yeah. You know what it takes to cause your liver to shut down? Almost, it's almost impossible. But when you're doing it with Tylenol in a week, you can shut it yeah. down. So, and now, now let me go on to. I just thought you'd appreciate that aspect. Yep. That the physician fails the patient, Thank not you. the other way around. It's nice to hear. And I'm sorry that we do that, but I'm trying to change that. And I'm working with physicians so that this we can This is why I'm talking that. to you. And it doesn't have to, right. <laughs> and it doesn't have to be that the physician knows. They just have to know where to refer. Exactly. And so when I have patients, do I refer a diabetes patient to an endocrinologist? And they ask me, do I need to go to an endocrinologist? And my answer is yes. Because we both need to be following you. We both need to be working together. Right. Because endocrinologists know their stuff when it comes to diabetes. Right. And there are studies that show that they get the best results as far as conventional medicine goes. But it needs to be working together. It needs to be they go to the endocrinologist yeah. and then they come to the integrative, but they work together. It doesn't mean they necessarily have to talk to each other because physicians tend to be touchy about talking to each other sometimes, or they don't have the time is really the factor. Yeah. But they see from each other what they're doing and they look right. at the changes and they see and they go and the patient explains and they give notes back and forth or whatever it happens to be. But the patient explains that this person did this. What do you think? Okay, now I'm going to take it back to them. And it works really well. And the endocrinologist feels proud and the integrative physician feels proud, but neither are stepping on each other's toes. And the ultimate goal is to treat the patient. Right. Okay, okay, okay. Come on, come on. Tell him about his mom. Him tell him about his mom. Okay. So I wanted you to salivate. <laughs> yes. Um, so pièce de résistance, I'll call it. His mom is 79 yeah. years old. And obviously diabetes runs in his family. And we're doing this in reverse. So we're doing it backwards. She's 79 years old and she comes to me and her A1C is pretty high. Her A1C is about eight um, and that's qualified as uncontrolled and medication below seven is qualified as control. Uh, medication with an A1C below seven, that three month sugar, and I'm sorry to repeat that. It's just so you don't have to right. connect it up, but a three month sugar below seven is called control. And I'm going to deviate for one second on the A1C, but you're going to appreciate this. There was a trial called the Accord trial, and there was another trial called the Advanced trial. They were both trials published in the New England Journal of Medicine, mm -hmm. that little rag that nobody knows. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> there were 10,000 people in both trials, and they were randomized controlled trials. Wow. And someone had the brilliant idea of, it, can we bring these people down to non-diabetic levels. Now, what they called non-diabetic levels were really pre-diabetes, less than 6.0 on the A1C, because right. right now the standard 7.0. And do that with medication. And do that with medication. This is all about medication. Yeah. And so they got to about 6.4 or 6.5, and they had to stop. Right. Because Why? I'm glad you asked, <laughs> because more patients died from right. polypharmacy, and they were on an average of four hypoglycemic medications, yes. and that's four diabetes medications. Yes. And four diabetes medications seems like a lot, but it's not. 
a lot of diabetes patients are on three, four, five medications. And so let me go back to Eric's mother. Eric's mother came with an A1C of 8.0, and she was on two insulins and two other diabetes medications. And he talks about him remembering when he was a young child, her using insulin. So she's right. been this way she's, for a long she's been time. This, she's been this way for years and years and years. Yeah, she's been in, using insulin for years. Now, insulin, not to knock insulin. When the, insulin has been life-saving. When insulin right. came along, it was life-saving. And it still is life-saving. And not everybody wants to change. You can't change the whole world. And I'm, I've got a biased population because they come to me. So I think I can change the whole world, but I know I can't. I can change people who want to make exactly. that step, want to learn about it, want right. to know. And I can bring that to them. I can inspire them. Not only can I help them change, but I can inspire them while doing it. And I can make the medicine go down a little easier by giving a little sugar. And when I mean sugar, I mean metaphorically, I can make them laugh. And I try to use humor in my lectures and in my presentations and in my one-on-ones with patients, I try to make them laugh. And I know that it was hard to make you laugh, but, you know, yeah. I, 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 I try to make them laugh. And I, I find that it works by saying some outrageous things. And they laugh and we work together. And once right. they laugh, I know they're going to do really well. Okay, great. So, come on, come on, come on. Tell, tell, okay, tell about so she's mom. had been on insulin for uh, a long time. 30, 40, 50 years, whatever. After a month of starting the diet, I get a call from Eric and he says, should we cut the insulin? And I said, why do you say that? And he said, because the sugars are running around 70 and 60, 70. I'm like, holy crap, we should cut the insulin right away. Now, I didn't expect her to um, do so well right away because her mobility is not the greatest and everything else. And I thought that was going to affect how she eats, how she does it, you know, everything that was going on. Oh my God, she was great. She's a wonderful woman. Not to mention she's a wonderful woman in terms of personality and she's wonderful all around to work with. But um, she jumped onto the bandwagon and she dropped two insulins in a month and she has, right. And her A1C has dropped to near non-diabetic levels. She's pre-diabetic, but it's dropped to non-diabetic, near non-diabetic levels. And she's not on insulin anymore. And we're ready to take her off the other medications. And it's only been about three or four months. It's only been about three or four months. But not only that, we cut the cholesterol med in half just recently because she's doing so well and we're going to cut it down even more. And the only reason I didn't cut it down even more is because she still has inflammation, but her inflammation went dramatically down. Her CRP, which we were using had been around double digits around uh, 12, 13. It's now around two. Ideally you want it less than one to be optimal, to be average, which is kind of ironic because the labs will say one to three is normal and it's called average. But to be optimal, you have to be less than one. And so we want to get her less than two at least before we cut more of the statin because the Jupiter trial showed, and this is a guy from Harvard again, sorry to keep quoting Harvard, but this is a guy from Harvard who ran the study that showed that people who had less than two on the CRP or the inflammation and had lower cholesterol did much better than people who just had lower cholesterol and higher inflammation. So we're almost ready to take off all of the statin for her. Oh, She's wait, changed. wait, wait. You mean your CRP can change? Uh, um, yes, your CRP can change. I say your that, I say that, sorry, I say that tongue in cheek because. Yes, I know, I know, I know. My doctor said to me, because I asked her, I said, when I first started this, I said, I want to have my CRP done for a baseline. She said, okay, fine. So we did that and we get it back and it was high. And I said, well, I want to do this again in six months to see what changes. And she's like, Why? I'd like to see right. if it changes. Right. Right. She's like, well, no, because the insurance is an expensive test and the insurance are not going to pay for it. And da, 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 da. And I said, by the way, it's not an expensive me. test. Humor me. Right. Humor me. I, I, I want to do it. Okay. Well, and I said, I'll pay for it if I have to, whatever. And when it came back, it was, it was dramatically reduced. <laughs> and, and her response, well, it was probably a bad test the first time. Right. Right. That right. was, that well, was my response. 
let me also, let me expound on the fact that when we talk about diabetes with Eric and his mother, the number one risk factor for diabetes patients isn't the sugar. It's the cardiovascular disease. They die prematurely of cardiovascular events. Right. Medications don't prevent the cardiovascular event. There are some new medications that now reduce. And that when I was looking at one of those medications called Jardians reduces, they're called, the class is called SGLT2 uh, inhibitors. They're SGLT2 co-transport inhibitors. And what they do is Jardians was shown to reduce the risk of cardiovascular death, supposedly, by 38%. You say, wow, that's great. And all cause death by 32%. That's great too. But and and 14% in terms of reducing the risk of cardiovascular events. You reduce it by 14%. That's great. But, of course, of course, aspirin reduces the risk of cardiovascular events by 20%. So already the aspirin shows that it reduces that event. But let me put it to you this way. Would you get a computer that had virus protection that protected your protected your computer so that it cut out 38% of the viruses? So only 62% of the viruses could get through. Would you get a virus protector? What would you say about that virus protector? <laughs> right. Not good. You're you're Not good. I Not mean, good. come on, I can reduce it 38% so you won't get that virus. Mm -hmm. What if you I can know. do it with lifestyle modification where yeah. you can reduce that macrovascular aspect that the drugs really can't touch very well and reduce it down to almost nothing, down to below... One percent. It's just where the risk the is symptoms. Low 1%. It's not, and you're not going towards the cause. Right, right. And the side effects of these medications are oh you got to be careful of renal failure or kidney failure, yeah. and you've got to be careful of urinary tract infections. And if you get dehydration, and if you get the dizziness, and you know all these side effects from this L SGLT two inhibitors. And not to say that everybody can do this, and it's not easy to do this, but when you do change your lifestyle, your taste buds change. Yes, Food do. tastes better. And in a week or two, your taste buds really change. And I've heard this over and over and over again from my patients and many others. Your taste buds change. So you're able to do this. This is why it's a lifestyle change or a lifestyle modification as opposed to a diet. A yeah. diet is a restriction where you can't have certain things and you're just cutting out your favorite exactly. things that have that make your taste buds go wild. So you can't have those, but you can have a dried ham sandwich with, you know, whole grain bread. And that's better than having it with bacon or I picked the wrong one, not ham <laughs> sandwich, but you can have yeah. a whole a dried turkey sandwich with Russian dressing, but not hold off the cheese. I mean, that's not really going to get you where you, or hold off the bacon. That's really not going to get you where you want to go. And right now we're a cheese crazy um, oh, environment. <laughs> I did a whole series with Neil Barnard and his book, The Cheese Trap. So yeah. you, it's amazing. I mean, if you haven't read that book, wow. Powerful. Yeah. Well, you, you know what I say powerful. to people about cheese? I say you can have cheese on one condition. This is one of those. Remember I said- You allow you, cheese- Yes, I said you can. I allow cheese. I said you can have cheese on one condition. Okay. And it's, it's not the condition. Uh, well, maybe it is. Dr. Weil believes, um, uh, you know, Dr. Weil, of right? Of course. And he was basically, I qualify him as the grandfather of the field of starting it and everything else. He says that hard cheeses are much better quality than soft cheeses. So you can have hard cheeses. And so do I believe in hard cheeses? You're going to ask me and you're about to, your eyes are about to pop out of your head. And the answer is absolutely not. He has to wear his shirt out of his pants because he's obese from eating hard cheeses. And so I say you can have cheese on one condition. The condition is go to the men's locker room, find the guy with the worst athlete's foot, suck his toes. If you like the taste of it, that's what you're eating. There was a study done 
in Dublin, Ireland at Trinity College, where they took foot bacteria, belly button bacteria, and armpit bacteria, and they made cheese out of it. I even have the study if you want to post it. So I say, if that's what you want, go ahead and eat your foot bacteria because you should be licking the floor of every gym locker room. Have you heard about the one, the cheese that's in Italy? Have you heard about this one? What's that? It's a it's a hard cheese that they use, and uh-huh. they put it out on the counter, uh-huh. and the flies come and lay their eggs on it. Uh-huh. Okay, uh-huh. and the larvae hatches, and uh-huh. it starts to crawl around on the cheese, and it starts to soften the cheese, and it makes it soft and almost like a brie kind of a thing. Uh-huh. And so you take a cracker and eat the cheese with the larvae, the larvae. Oh, and they God. have special. Um, uh, cardboard that you put that goes underneath your nose uh-huh. so you can scoop the cracker because the larvae can jump up and can jump up into your nose kind of oh thing. Oh my god. So they scoop it up and then they eat the cheese oh. with uh-huh. the larvae. I'm uh-huh. like, are you kidding me? And wow. I have a friend of mine who's down in, who's uh, my neighbor down in from Italy. And I went over to her and I said, after I read this in, in <laughs> Dr. Barnard's book, I said, Please tell me he's making this up. She says, "Oh my God, no, that's a delicacy." And I'm like, "What?" <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, yeah, all right. Yeah, that made your night, right? Yeah, yeah, all right. absolutely. Well, anyway, Doctor Deneev, it has been an absolute pleasure talking with you. I mean, I think we've covered pretty much everything under the sun. But I'm sure yes. we'd have yes. more time next time. I'd love to talk to you again and uh, come up with more topics. Wow. You've been a fount of knowledge. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed. I enjoyed. I can't believe we've been talking for this long. I know. Oh my <laughs> it's going to be fun editing. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my holy crap. I know. Oh, well, my God. Wow. I, I thought this was, uh, when I looked down, I was like, well, wow. This is like half an hour, I thought, went by. But, you know. Or, Time flies when you're having fun. Yeah. And I certainly yeah. have. So thank you so much. Well, Dave. sorry for taking so much time. No, it's been but, great. It's been amazing. Yeah, I, I enjoyed. It, it was it, wonderful. It has been. It's, I've learned so much. So thank you very much. Well, thank you for the opportunity. This was great. And the questions were wonderful. <laughs>